the invention of Mexicans, Chicanos, and Nepantla. The Chicano identity has been shaped by two major European interventions in the Americas. The first was the Spanish colonization of the indigenous populations inhabiting what is now known as the USA, Mexico, Canada, and most countries of Latin America. The second was the subsequent takeover by Anglo settlers, founding an imposed nation known today as the United States of America over the already Spanish colonized indigenous lands which had become Mexican regions of the Southwest. We will begin by discussing the colonization of the Americas, particularly the case of Mexico, the persistent effects of this colonialism within a concept coined as coloniality, and the context of the birth of mestizo identity in Mexico in relation to the formation of Chicano identity in the United States, inheriting from the Mexican mestizo experience, equally searching for its suppressed indigenous roots, but now within the context of a second layer, the one of Anglo empire in the United States. The birth of mestizo and Chicano identities comes forth through a supremacist imposition of language, race, religion, and epistemology, and a pattern of hierarchical thinking where the native versions of all these are imagined as inferior or less advanced than the white Western European versions. Colonialism. What does colonialism refer to in reference to the Americas? European nations came to the Americas to increase their wealth and broaden their influence over world affairs. The Spanish were among the first Europeans to explore the New World and the first to settle in what is now the United States. In February 1519, Hernán Cortés tried to conquer the Aztec Empire. They had to wait a couple of years and try several times with other native allies before they were actually able to overthrow the order on August 1521. This was the beginning of Spanish colonization in Mexico. There is so much to say about this episode in history, especially since the ideas that we have of mestizaje today, initiated in colonial times, but were cemented in our imaginaries through media arts post-Mexican Revolution of 1910. The conquista and mestizaje were topics that were used to define Mexicanidad, or what it meant to be Mexican. The historical event was used as a unifying dynamic for the construction of a nationalist discourse characterized by the identity of mestizaje. The definition of coloniality stems from a concept called coloniality of power, coined by Aníbal Quijano, Peruvian theorist and philosopher. This concept interrelates the practices and legacies of European colonialism and social orders and forms of knowledge. This legacy is especially present in the form of racism and social discrimination integrated within social orders. Here, we will learn specifically how it is embedded within the formation of identities themselves, concepts of identity based solely on race, such as whiteness, blackness, and mestizoness. The colonial structure of power resulted in a caste system, one that was blatantly openly implemented in Mexico. Maria Lugones adds that coloniality imposes values and expectations on gender as well. Women, gender non-conforming, and sexualities which are not heterosexual are seen as inferior. If you want to learn more about coloniality, take my Decolonizing Chicano, Latino Media, and Cultures class. As for this class, we need to understand that Chicano identity is dealing with a legacy, and that because of what we experience, we are endowed with a certain sensibility or way of seeing the world that comes from inhabiting the in-between, in that place where you feel like you do not belong anywhere. To understand the idea of brown identity as a mixture that stems from mestizaje, we need to revisit the concept of the casta system which began in colonial times. During the Nueva España colonial period, Racial mixtures were organized through a caste system. It was meant to differentiate people by the level of Christian blood in them. Spaniards from the Iberian Peninsula were of course the most Christian of all, calling themselves Ibericos. Following them were the Criollos, or children of Spanish mother and father. Mestizos were the children of a native with a Spanish, mestizo meaning mixed. Castizos were mestizos who have mixed with Spanish, castizo meaning chaste or cleansed. Españoles were the product of a castizo with another Spanish, meaning the race was purified once again. Mulatos were the children of a Spanish or Español with moro, word used for black back then. Mulato comes from the word mula, meaning mule, the mixture between a horse and a donkey. Moriscos were the children of Spanish and mulatos, meaning a little bit black. The less Spanish blood in the caste, the more animalistic the names became. For example, coyote, lobo, and the infamous salta patras, which means jump backwards, and tente en el aire, floating in the air, and no te entiendo, I don't get you, or I don't understand you. Chino was a child of a morisco and an español, but if that chino mixed with an indio, you got a salta patras, jump backwards. If that salta patras mixed with a mulato, then you got a lobo, or a wolf. 
In Mexico, we have an issue with our mestizo identity because it was an imposed identity and at the same time used to cement the effects of coloniality into our identity itself. Mestizo is used to create us and to erase us simultaneously. It is an inheritance of segregations, which has in turn affected many other aspects of our society and relations. Mexican artists and musicians have dedicated lots of work to the effects of coloniality found in the identity of mestizaje. The next song, for example, is a Mexican alternative rock and español song by a band called La Maldita Vecindad y Los Hijos del Quinto Patio titled Salta Pa' Atrás, Jump Backwards. It's from song tracing coloniality to current issues. What kind of personal experiences do you think inspired this song? This, like many other more contemporary examples, are part of a legacy of artist renditions of this experience. In the reforming of the Mexican nation and identity following the Mexican Revolution of 1910, depictions of our colonial past, the struggle with coloniality and mestizo identity were cemented on murals around Mexico, particularly in Mexico City. Murals were a way of educating the masses who were for the most part illiterate post-Mexican Revolution. They were a way of telling interpretative versions of our history in a way that was also defiant to those rich and powerful who were commissioning them. The Chicano is cemented in the mestizo identity as propagated by these murals, and the paintings and media and paraphernalia inspired by these murals. If we think about it, the Chicano identity is another living and happening mural for all of U.S. Mexicans and other Latinos who do not quite know the details of their history, but who are conscious of the wrongdoings and the injustices they currently endure as a process of coloniality. Let's look at three mural examples that will help us understand our struggle in relation to mestizaje and Mexican identity. This mural painting is titled La Fusión de Dos Culturas, or The Fusion of Two Cultures, 1963, by Jorge González Camarena, located in the Museo Nacional de Historia de México, del Castillo de Chapultepec. What do you see in this mural? What was the conquest like, according to the artist? What is mestizaje if this is what the fusion of two cultures looks like? This mural has had many titles, including La Lucha de la Conquista, Choque y Fusión de Europa, Fusión de Europa y América, Las Razas y la Cultura, The Struggle of Conquest, Shock and Fusion of Europe, Fusion of Europe and America, The Races and Culture. Why do you think the title was changed so much? What does this tell you about the purpose of the painting? These murals circulate not only via the architecture of the cities, but via objects of exchange, such as postage stamps and pesos bills. González Camarena worked the topic of La Conquista from various angles. He portrayed La Conquista event as a dramatic process of simultaneous clash and reconciliation. This paradox marks the thought of Mexican nationalism during the first half of the 20th century. It centered itself on the study of mestizaje, its identities, giving it innumerable philosophical, literary, and artistic interpretations, which try to give answers to the question, what does it mean to be Mexican? This self-reflection gave way to multiple discourses, both visual and verbal, that fed the construction of identity symbols and collective imaginaries. At first, this may seem quite revolutionary considering that La Fusión de Dos Culturas was an answer to Diego Rivera's details on his murals dedicated to La Conquista. Prominent are those found in the walls of El Palacio Nacional and the San Ildefonso College. These are details from his murals Historia de México, History of Mexico, and La Colonización, Desembarco, Llegada de Hernán Cortés a Veracruz, Colonization and Arrival of Hernando Cortés to Veracruz, 1929-1950, where Rivera highlighted a supposed superiority of the Spanish before the indigenous. Rivera shows suffering of Indians and poor people. He depicts the evil rich people and foreigners who took over Mexico. The story is one of good versus evil. 
the poor, peasants, Indian farmers, and workers are on the side of good and freedom. The foreigners, the rich, and the rulers are the bad and oppressive ones. Rivera, the artist, shows the struggle of the people not necessarily in a more romanticizing way, but in a differently romantic way. Diego Rivera's expression perpetuates the idea of the indigenous subject as object and perpetual victim, unwilling or unable to resist or respond with equal or greater force, whereas Camarena decided to project an equality of force and prowess without diminishing dignity. He took our collective imaginaries and identity symbols and placed them over a great paradox of simultaneous creation, construction, and destruction. Yet, this paradox representation also takes away from the horrid repercussions on indigenous peoples, depicted here as equal players. The American Holocaust and the attempt to exterminate indigenous culture and power are canceled out. This fact of history is sacrificed, ironically, in order for the possibility of the Mexican mestizo nation to emerge as a homogenous nation. Homogeneity was imposed upon our lands as well, as a way of validating our existence as a people. Camarena's perspective creates a dangerous neutral silencing syncretism that leaves out the complex interrelation between the settlers and the native people of the Americas. Syncretism refers to the mixture of cultures, as if we take half of your culture, I take half of mine, and we happily mix. But we all very well know that was not the case. Then there was a depiction of José Clemente Orozco, who painted the exhibition called Los Teules. 1947. His exhibition was inspired by Bernal Díaz del Castillo's The True History of the Conquest of New Spain, written in 1576. The collection includes 60 paintings to demystify the vision of the conquest. It is thanks to Díaz del Castillo's chronicles that we know the atrocities the natives were subjected to at the hands of the Spanish. Teules comes from Teotl. The Spaniards were called this, meaning demons, but they heard Teul and thought it meant they were seen as divinities or gods because one meaning of Teotl is God, but it also means demon or any sort of divinity. José Clemente Orozco's paintings include Cabeza de Caballo and El Alanceado, Malinche y Hernán Cortés, and murals like Cortés y la Malinche from 1926, Hernán Cortés, painted from 1940 to 1945, and Cortés and the Cross. In these murals, we can see his critical stance, no longer one of mere syncretism. For example, in Cortés y la Malinche, we see the mestizo father and mother sitting side by side. Yet, we can see that he's placing his arm before her as if keeping her from going away or from moving forward. He's not simply holding her hand, he's holding her down and forcing her to be next to him. Malinche and her oppressor are behind the body of a dead native man. So, what is Orozco telling us about the roots of mestizaje? While González Camarena gives us a posture of conciliation, Clemente Orozco does it from a focus on that which we do not want to see, or rarely see face to face, the destruction of native culture, the cost of this so-called progress. Orozco sees mestizaje as a confrontation. In his 1945 autobiography, he writes, Nuestra personalidad no está todavía bien definida en nuestra conciencia, aunque lo esté perfectamente en el terreno de los hechos. No sabemos aún quiénes somos, como los enfermos de amnesia. Nos clasificamos continuamente en indios, criollos y mestizos, atendiendo solo a la mezcla de sangres, como si se tratara de caballos de carrera. Y de esa clasificación han surgido partidos saturados de odio que hacen una guerra a muerte, indigenista e hispanista. Our personality is not yet well defined in our consciousness, even if it is perfectly defined in the terrain of fact. We still don't know who we are like those who are sick with amnesia. We classify ourselves continuously as Indians, criollos, and mestizos, attending only to the mixture of bloods, as if we were racehorses. And from those classifications, parties saturated in hatred have emerged, who declare a war to the death, indigenous and hispanists. In the posture of the indigenous, the conquistador was not a creator or benefactor of Mexico, but an usurper of indigenous sovereignty, considering colonialism as a dark parenthesis during which the real true wholeness of the Mexican people was buried. In what ways have we been buried? To understand, let's revisit and review colonialism and coloniality. The current idea we have of mestizo identity was shaped not only by colonialism, which began in 1492, but by coloniality, which according to Peruvian philosopher Aníbal Quijano, 
is a continuation of the hierarchical racist cosmovision that colonialism inherited the Americas and which inhabits the social, political, and national formation of Latin American countries, Canada, the United States, and their current institutions. European settlements brought with them great impositions on the people of the Americas. The first major dominance points pertain to language, race, cosmovisions, and what we refer to as religion today, and epistemology. In Mexico, this translated to the imposition of Spanish over native languages, imposition of white race over all of the races, imposition of Catholicism over any other creed, and the suppression of native knowledge in the construction of Eurocentric schools and universities. This imposed order forced many of our ancestors to experience their identity in a way within a society that through history still maintained our identities hostage. These experiences have been continuous and remain today for us as contemporary Chicanos. This marginalization or treatment of a person, group, or concept as insignificant or peripheral results in the feeling of not belonging of not being from here or there. This feeling is the result of coloniality, or the maintenance of the hierarchical order in which we live today. The USA is a country whose foundation has been dominated by Western European colonial settlers who have proactively denied including the Chicano presence and perspective in the process and have gone further into denying and criminalizing our longing for and belonging to these lands. They basically faked it till they made it. To appear as if these lands were and have always belonged to the settler white Western Europeans and their descendants. This was done by holding up the lack of inclusion of the part of history, language, religion, epistemology, or what is considered to be knowledge and race of the indigenous peoples of the Americas and of those other oppressed peoples, particularly Africans and Asians, who were forced to participate in the making of this nation. In addition, we have the proactive stance that has been the ill-representation or criminalization of the people who resisted and struggled against the oppression, violence, and dehumanization by continuously portraying them as evil, animalistic, wild, uncivilized, dirty, and inherently criminal. For example, the bandidos and Indians in the Cowboys and Indians movies, dime novels, political cartoons and newspapers, and in wanted posters. Later, the narcos and cholos and the undocumented immigrants or perpetual foreigners, because even when we are born here, people assume we're not from here, like what happened to Chich Marin's character in the film Born in East LA. To counteract this limited understanding of our identity, where we are being perceived in a perpetual in-between as a perpetual foreigner, as an inherent criminal, as drug addict, as servant, without connecting the dots as to how society itself and the marginalization of our people has actually provoke the situations where we find ourselves fulfilling such stereotypical prophecies. American scholar of Chicana cultural feminist and queer theory, Gloria Evangelina Ansaldúa, a fronteriza from the Mexico-Texas border, theorized on this experience. She drew up from the Nahuatl concept of Nepantla. Nepantla means in the middle. She uses Nepantla to conceptualize her own experience as a Chicana queer woman. She based her theories on her own lifelong experiences of social cultural marginalization. Nahuatl is a language, and Nahuatl is the ethnicity and culture that the Mexica Tenochca, otherwise known as Aztecs, belong to. They were one of the groups belonging to the Nahuas. Nepantla can extend beyond the experiences of Chicanas to all people who inhabit and navigate from Nepantla, this middle space. Nepantleras are threshold people. They move within and among multiple, often conflicting worlds and refuse to align themselves exclusively with any single individual, group, or belief system. Nepantla is relative to living in the borderlands. It is the imagination, the unconscious that encompasses our historical suffering, the traumas, the emotional and spiritual aspects, but also the pride, the beauty, and resilience of our indigenous traditions, which made it to this day through the in-between. For example, indigenous people would kneel before the cross with an understanding that for them, the cross stood for olin, meaning the everything and the movement that makes it happen and the movement that it creates. Olin refers to the life, the wisdom, and the order of the natural world. It was a form of resistance that occurred in Nepantla, in the state of mind of the in-between, where indigenous people would, as Puerto Rican sociologist Ramón Grosuel puts it, be subversively complicit, making it appear as if they had been fully indoctrinated, but only to be able to maintain their practices and customs in between the lines. Of course, such proactive forms of resistance are invisible to the settler mind. Today, for many, this subversive complicity disappeared from their conscious mind, as the reasons behind the practices were not always passed on to the younger generations due to fear of further terrorism and cultural violence. Nepantla is a painful place where our sense of self has been shattered or is it constantly under question. To receive the wisdom and the healing powers that come with it, a Nepantlera has had to experience anxiety, confusion, and loss due to being in conscious or unconscious conflict with the imposed dominant cultural ideology. Ideology refers to a sort of system of ideas and ideals that are used by a group of people 
to make sense of the world. Ideologies end up creating a very limited worldview, which is static and with little to no movement, no olin. As you can see, this form of organizing our understanding of the world, especially when through a dominant ideology, can be dangerous. For example, right now I'm teaching you to see the world through the eyes of a Chicana person. It is an ideology, but it is not dominant. It is still perceived as an opinion. Ideologies become dangerous when people think that it is a standard way or objective way of thinking, a natural or matter-of-fact way. Finally, Nepantla is a liminal space from which multiple forms or takes on reality can be understood and seen at the same time, when two opposing concepts can exist even in spite of each other. Living between cultures results in seeing double, first from the perspective of one culture, then from the perspective of another. Seeing from two or more perspectives simultaneously renders those cultures transparent. Removed from that culture's center, you glimpse the sea in which you've been immersed, but to which you were oblivious no longer seeing the world the way you were enculturated to see it. Gloria E. Saldua. Nepantlerismo is a concept that can't help us further critique Chicano cinema. We can ask ourselves, in what ways do Chicano films embody Nepantleras? In what ways do they look to assimilate? In what ways do they resist? How are they healing? Chicanismo is an extension of the marginalized indigenous and or black side of us struggling against the centralized Hispanic or Spanish side within Mexico. And that later, this complex and already struggling Mexican identity comes on a second stance to confront the Anglo-American cultural imposition. Let us begin thinking, how can we add to the work that Chicano film has done? How can we as makers, producers, inventors be inspired by Nepantlerismo and add more works of media art to our Chicano catalog? What can we learn from muralistas? I leave you with a quote by Ana Luis Keaton. In From Borderlands and New Mestizas to Nepantlas and Nepantleras, who's also quoting Gloria Saldúa. From now, let us shift the path of conocimiento, inner work, public acts. We need to embrace our Nepantlerismo and as Nepantleras, recognize the deep common ground and interwoven kinship among all things and people and attempt to awaken this recognition in others. By so doing, they make possible new forms of community and new types of social action. So let's think about how we can make new forms of community and new types of social action. <laughs>